uh, manufacturers have like some form of electric vehicles available in either in prototype or in uh, production stage or somewhere in between. Now we have been part of uh, this journey with many uh, EV leaders and in our collaboration we learned quite a few things from them. So in today's session what I'm going to do is introduce you to such challenges and also tell you how they are looking at these problems and how they are trying to solve them. So here is a list of few of the key uh, focus areas. Now to mention a few, I think these are few things that you already know. So they talk to migration, thermal management, uh, and uh, various other things. Now, uh, the list that I have here, quite a few of them are already here. The people are already going through this. But there are a few forward looking challenges that I have put here. The idea really is to uh, tell everyone that what are the things that are coming in which are learned from various other uh, industries so that everyone is prepared. So let's uh, jump in. Now, before I proceed, I would also like uh, to show you like how the format is going to look like uh, on your right hand side you can see like I am going to put the one of the challenges and then show one of the potential solutions and uh, this I put like what the industry is doing what the solution might be. So let's jump in. So the first problem, range of right? This is really important and you all know that uh, whenever anyone is going to buy a vehicle they will look for range. And uh, to support this, uh, recently JT Power has put this one uh, and uh, they uh, found out that there are few key things that are really important. One is insect selection, of course, but also few other uh, things like uh, insects and uh, few things like quality and reliability and aftermarket. So these are few of the things that they are looking at. Okay. Now, if you want to connect this, how that, how these four problems now translate for the engineers. So they now have to really work on optimize the maximum amount of the vehicle. Uh, and uh, this optimization not only comes before the prototyping stage, but also like once you have the vehicle ready, you really want to get the maximum amount before you want to push another prototype or another push. Because development of such component is really important and difficult. And uh, time to market is very important to you know how competitive this market is. So how are they doing this? Uh, there have been like multiple solutions that they have adopted, but predominantly what they do is that they will make use of simulation as much as possible. They will build some models and then they will keep updating it uh, and to have a virtual representation of the system that they are going to work on to multiple iterations of simulation and uh, they will have, try to understand like can they or what are the things that they can optimize. How much uh, if the losses are there in the system, what are what are the sources and can they get out? Uh, so now to motivate you, there is one uh, example that I am happy to share. So since the inception, Krishna has been doing this and we have been part of it. They have uh, adopted model based design. This is the methodology that most of the automotive industry follows. The idea is that like, we would start off with creating a virtual representation of the system and then try to make it work. So what Krishna has been doing, they have started off with building their vehicle model for all the components that they work with and they have all the design decisions that they have taken everything always comes from the simulation models that they have done. And we all know like how the display is beating the range in the market and also how they are saying that the efficiency has is at a very uh, high number. So I have a link one reference here, uh, have a look at that, when they talked about how they found out that if they improve the uh, efficiency of their motors by 5%, overall system efficiency is improving by 80%, which is significant. And now people who have worked with this kind of uh, models and simulation, they would know that not everything translates directly from simulation to physical system, but that's a huge number. So I really encourage you to look into this uh, link that I have and you will learn more. The next problem statement uh, that everyone is worried about is thermal management. And uh, we all know how security this is. And the problems that might uh, occur if it is not handled better. Uh, now the uh, issue here is like uh, it is a really difficult system. I mean, the battery is a really complicated system, and it's not easy to understand the system well and uh, have a simulation model that you can use to develop the algorithm and test. So, how uh, engineers do it? So the idea is like uh, we are trying to break it into small problems, and uh, we always start with the first model that I showed. So we 
try to get as much as information that what is required and what is not. They do a very detailed development and do complex things. So try to use simulation to understand what is actually going on. How is the total money they are going to be? Right? Now, one thing that is important is uh, just understanding the component individually is not going to work. You need to integrate it back and then see how it works with other components as well. So, how to do that? Uh, so, there are various approaches. One of the approaches that most of the uh, companies are looking at is can we create some virtual display and run multiple iterations, like 1000 iterations or certain kilometers and see like, what happens. Now, we know that ranges are typically like 100 to 150. So, you run one lab with multiple number of times and see how it works. Now, because the systems are dependent on temperature, uh, if your model is very well enough and also validated with the human data, you can leverage a lot of output. You can design cool. You can even understand that you will cool for that one. So there is a lot to be uh, understood from this kind of systems and people are doing it. Uh, one another example uh, is my project. So they used system level simulation to optimize their battery model management system. What they did, uh, they took an approach where they relied on uh, the simulation and they had some distress areas where they could gather some that data on the battery. So they brought that in, created a model that suits them, and then they optimized the cooling system. Now, one thing to also understand is that the cooling will also uh, take energy from the battery. So, I mean, it's really, it might look like that, yeah, the middle of the cooling components will be made, but you have to understand that that energy is coming from battery itself. So, they not only optimize the design, but also optimize the components for the cooling so that they are getting a lot of gain. So let's suppose a good story. I uh, encourage you to, uh, this is actually a recorded video that we have in our website. I have been here. So I encourage you to go and have a look. Now moving on, uh, the next thing that we are nowadays focusing on is the development. Uh, I should also say that uh, now that government is encouraging in-house development, BMEs is probably the first thing that everyone is doing. And they are now moving on to motor consumption. And the idea is, to really decide the motor that is needed and design the algorithm and also deploy and test it. Everything in house, which will be much better because, because then they will have more control over optimizing the whole system. Because ultimately it comes to the range point, right? The better you have your system, the better optimized it is, and it's going to uh, be helpful. Uh, so I have uh, left few links. I will not go into the details of it, but if you are interested, please uh, reach out to us or we can answer them. These three points uh, that I talked about, these are the ones that experiment, like everyone is talking about. The next of the point, the next few points that I'm going to talk about is something that is coming up. And other industry who have gone through it, they are working on this. So, what are those? The first thing is data to engineering. What it means is that nowadays all the vehicles, as you know, that we are able to log quite a few data from that vehicle. So this is the field data that we are doing, right? So how can we leverage that? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, there are quite a few functionalities that we develop for our systems to do a lot of assumptions, which may or may not be right. And there is no way to validate when you are building it for the first time. And not only that, like if you have that amount of data from the field, you can also make use of machine learning, artificial intelligence to build certain algorithms where you can use the data to understand and also make it freely even before it has happened. So they are finding this as a predictive maintenance and digital twins are few other things that we are talking about. But the summary is that you would have a replica of the actual system that you have uh, at your uh, place where you know that how you feel the vehicle is behaving. And if needed, you can generate warning and uh, warn the user, even before it has happened. But one interesting user story that I have to share uh, is uh, from NI. Now, they are working with something called a state of health estimation. Uh, now, the fun thing about this is that this is a very difficult thing to uh, develop because you, you actually need to know how your battery behaves. But then you also need the system to be in place uh, so that you can protect it. So, it's a tool. How do you play with it? Uh, so, what NIO did uh, is that uh, uh, they started off with some basic algorithms which were supported by the simulation model set up. And they did a lot of simulations, they did corner case, cases simulation, generated synthetic data and deployed the algorithm. 
Now, once the algorithm is developed, there also comes the question of monitoring the uh, vehicle and all the data that they have. So what they did, they now took the data and then they uploaded everything to cloud and they are continuously updating all their algorithms and deploying it over the five over the year companies. So it's a continuous cycle. And they are also leveraging cloud-based solution here. So it's the entire organization has access to all these algorithms and they can always anyone can contribute to it. So this is something that uh, I think is like really, uh, we have worked with them and then we are quite happy that it really worked out and we are moving into this uh, Now a few of the rest of the things that I have, uh, there are something that are coming up, uh, but still I have left some information in this slide for you to refer. I will uh, skim over this uh, detail. The first thing is uh, efficiency in the software development. Now, the complexity that we are seeing in the uh, vehicle, the amount of functionality that we are having, uh, along with uh, all the safety, like uh, you also need to have uh, cyber security in the building, right? In your vehicle. So, software is getting really complex, and uh, if you go through these two reports that I have at the bottom, you will see that uh, the complexity is rising exponentially, but the productivity is not. So, what is happening is that we have way too many functionality to be deployed, but they are such complicated that they, you need really complicated testing framework as well. And uh, uh, that is where you need to really adopt a piston class software development process to do that. Now, from Mathworks point of view, we have been working with this for various other industries, so we have that uh, knowledge and we are also helping quite a few volumes to adopt. Alright, so uh, that was the last point I thought I would highlight. But there are few also other things that are coming up. So, for example, reskilling and upskilling the workforce is something that is important. Okay, and that is happening. Uh, then there are some, some things like OEM and supplier relationship uh, that has to that is improving, and there is functional shift, safety and compliance that is also something that we can do. Uh, These are things that are coming from other uh, adjacent industries, and we are pretty certain that those will be seen in the this market as well. So the slide deck and all the stories and there are also quite a few other uh, links and information that is available in the deck, uh, which will be available to you. You can also reach out to me here and uh, if there is something you want to see today, we have a demo on our site, we can talk uh, about that in detail. So with that, uh, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, great to be here. I think I can safely say that I am uh, I'm the youngest on the stage here today. Not in terms of age, I'm pretty sure I'm not the youngest in terms of age, but in terms of the age of the company. Uh, our company, Urja, Urja.energy, which is also our website, is uh, uh, about three and a half, four months old now. So we are very young and we are thankful for this opportunity to present to all of you. Thanks a lot to the entire organizing team of uh, Mobility Outlook. Uh, and we are thrilled to be here. So before I start talking, maybe a little bit of uh, an introduction to ourselves. Um, my name is Vineet and uh, uh, like I said, we, uh, the, the three of us, I'll show you our photos later on, we've started a company to do predictive, to build a software for predictive modeling. And we had a two-fold goal behind doing this. The first one was, you know, the world over, when people look at India, they look at us as a country which uses softwares in the space of scientific community. They never look at us as a country which can make its own software. And there's no reason why we cannot do it because we have some of the best modelers, the best researchers, we have a great talent pool. So why are we not making our own software? And I come, all of us, or three of us actually, we come from the scientific computing industry. We've been doing this for over 20 years and we thought, why can't we do this ourselves? Why can't we keep that IP in India? And that was one of the, one of the big reasons behind starting. And the second is coincidentally something that uh, we have been discussing today. And that was we wanted to simplify design. So it's very interesting. We had a great session in the morning, and uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Balhotra and uh, Nikhilesh, I think they made a great point, right? They said uh, you need an RD mindset, which is absolutely true. But let us all take a step back and ask ourselves why is it so difficult for us to have an RD mindset? And the reality is the market we are in, right? In the very first se session, uh, Mr. Madhavan threw a lot of great numbers with us. And one of the numbers was, he, they asked people, how much are you willing to spend for a two-wheeler, right, a e-two-wheeler. And almost 50% of said, uh, them said less than one lakh, and 
75 percent said you know I mean, it was less than 1.5 lakh. So, so you see, you you are, you are in a market where a majority of the people are extremely cost conscious, and there's nothing wrong with that. And the problem with this R&D mindset is the tools that you need for R&D are extremely expensive. And when I say they are expensive, I am not talking about the amount of money that you need to spend to buy the tools, which of course is a lot. But apart from that, it's expensive to use these tools. Coincidentally, like I said, uh, uh, you know, Abhishek was just saying it takes maybe somewhere from six months to two years to uh, to be adept at using MATLAB. And the way I look at it, MATLAB is one of the easiest softwares to uh, work with. The others are even more uh, difficult to work with. So, so that's the kind of learning curve you have. Uh, then once you set up the models for predictive analysis, physics-based predictive analysis, I'm not talking about uh, you know, mathematical analysis, solving these models is also very difficult. You need experts, you need to hire experts to set up, analyze the results from these. So all of this, you know, when, when it's going to take you two, three years, uh, extensive amount of resources, it slows down the whole product development process. And that's the challenge we want to solve. We want to simplify design in every sense of the word. And I'll, I'll get to what I mean uh, in the upcoming slides. But our primary goal is make a world-class software out of India, bring people together to do that, and to simplify the entire design process. And, and so, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, what's, you know, the, the, why I'm so excited about this and the approach we are using, and which is very relevant to the discussion we are having. But the exciting thing about batteries today is that we are all in the same boat. Whether you talk about the people who have the most experience in, uh, in EVs, you know, people like maybe GM and Tesla and uh, Nissan maybe, or you look at uh, many of the young startups that you see here, we are all in the same boat. Let us not forget that. And that's what is most exciting. And the reason for that is simple. IC engines have been around for 300 years. The technology is mature. EVs have been around, you know, if you look at the first road-worthy car in the late 2000s. So it's a very new technology. Today morning, uh, uh, Mr. Munjal was saying, every two to three years, it's a completely new chemistry, which is, you know, so you're you working with a completely new engine, so to speak. So technology is moving ahead at a rapid pace. And that's what is exciting. And that's why we have so many players in the market, because everything is new to everybody. So that's something we should not forget. A lot of times we think, uh, when I say we, I mean some of the smaller companies think that you know the bigger companies today have an edge over us. But the reality is they don't. Even uh, the good, you know, I mean, some of the bigger uh, EV companies in US take three to four years to commercialize, uh, you know, all from the time they decide on the chemistry to the time the, the vehicle hits the road is a period of about three to four years. So we are all on the same boat. Let us not forget that. And that is what makes it exciting. And, and that is why we chose to work with batteries because batteries pose a unique challenge when it comes to predictive model. So what I mean by that is, now all of you are familiar with the analysis tools, of course, physics-based modeling. You use it for structural analysis, uh, CFD, heat transfer, all of these things. And the thing is that there's a well-established template there. You know how to do it. And if you enter the right parameters, you get accurate results. Unfortunately, this doesn't work with batteries because batteries pose a unique challenge. Even at the cell level, if you look at just the cell level, there are upwards of 20 unknown parameters. Things like, uh, you know, maybe the porosity. I think one, one person had right now asked, what are the parameters that you need to input? And that's an excellent question because in almost every case, nobody knows what these parameter values are because the cell manufacturers don't share those values with them. Things like the porosity of the electrode, uh, even the conductivity actually is unknown because it's anisotropic. Uh, the exchange current density, electrokinetics, there are many unknowns. So when you have a huge parameter space, 20 plus unknown parameters, setting up an accurate model when you don't have data is practically impossible. Which is something Abhishek alluded to. He said, you know, when you, you have to be careful. You can't expect absolute accuracy when you're building a physics-based model. And this is the reason for that because we are working with a huge unknown parameter space. So how do you tackle this problem is something we'll talk about. But what I want to highlight again in the two and three wheeler space is that batteries are the most important component of the electric vehicle. So at the design stage, it is very important to account for how your battery is performing. 
and especially in the battery, the temperature is the most critical component. Anything that happens in the battery, at the cell level, the pack level, and at the system level, is purely governed by the temperature of the cell. Whatever you think about, whether it's the performance of the battery, whether it's the life of the battery, and obviously the safety, all of this temperature plays the most important part. Just to give you an example, if you operate a battery at uh, 45 degrees versus 35 degrees, the life of your battery is going to come down by half, right? Or if, if your battery is at rest, uh, you know, uh, it, you, it, it's undergoing calendar aging, for instance. So it's at rest and whenever the battery is at rest, it discharges. If it's uh, at a temperature of 40 degrees, it's it, it almost exponentially higher degradation than, than if it was at 25 degrees. Uh, even if you talk about thermal runaway, uh, research has shown that if you overcharge, so if you fast charge incorrectly, then uh, the onset of thermal runaway is going to reduce from 100 degrees to 60 degrees. So these are the kinds of things that you need to account for at the design stage. And a lot of us today don't anticipate these problems because we have not had vehicles which have been on the road that long. So you don't know if you're, you know, today you don't know how long your battery is going to last. And that may not be a problem today. But if you have uh, 100,000 customers and they all come back to you after three years saying, Okay, replace my battery for free. That's going to be a big problem in three years. So these are some of the small things that we need to consider, or you know, things that we need to consider today. Where if we make small changes to our battery design, we'll be all set for the future. And this is especially important for the two and three wheel industry. Again, going back to what we discussed today morning, uh, Mr. Madhavan was saying over 50 percent of the people are concerned about safety, and obviously it's it's, it's obvious. That's because you know, it's, it's in the news all the time, people are concerned about it. He also said that range, when it came to range, a majority of the people said two to three hours from to full. And I'm sure we all understand that if you want to go from let's say 25% to 100% in two hours, it's not easy, it's very difficult. And you will have to fast charge. And when you start fast charging, there's a host of problems which you might encounter, not right away. But in three to four, four years, because you can accelerate the aging, you can degrade the battery faster. So you know, uh, when you talk about abuse, uh, usually people talk about three types of abuse. They talk about thermal abuse, which is the biggest, uh, electrical abuse, and mechanical abuse. But there's actually a fourth kind of abuse. You know, these are all extreme conditions, catastrophic conditions. There's a fourth kind of abuse which we all need to be aware of, and that's the electrochemical abuse. Because at the core, you know, in a battery, the entire battery, like I said, the system, pack, module, all of it is governed by what happens at the sandwich level, at the cell level. And that's the electrochemistry. So if you're constantly uh, you know, going from uh, the depth of discharge is 100 to 5, for instance, and you keep repeating this cycle. Uh, or like I said, if you fast charge it uh, indiscriminately, all of this is electrochemical abuse, which is going to cumulatively lead to some catastrophe in the future. And then, you know, it's too late to do anything once the vehicle is on the road. And that is why predictive analysis uh, is so important. And like I said, it's, it's you know, you, there's some small steps that you can take today which can help you uh, go a long way in the future. So, like I said, you know, I think I've covered most of these things, but safety, what's the onset of thermal runaway going to be? How is it going to propagate? What's the life of the battery is very important. How, are, how is my user behavior? You know, you're running a vehicle in Bangalore versus Delhi versus Srinagar. These are completely different geographies, temperatures, user profiles, fleet versus passenger. How are all these things going to impact the life of my vehicle? It is possible to do this at the design stage and therefore prevent some catastrophic incidents in the labor. So the question is, do you want to invest in testing or use mathematical modeling with it? Because both approaches are available. And like I said, there are some people who rely extensively on testing. Uh, there are a lot of unknown questions. You know, how does the uh, temperature of the battery, what's the temperature of each of the cells in the battery, what's the delta T in the uh, pack? That is also important. Not only is the absolute temperature important, but the temperature difference between the maximum and minimum uh, of the cells in the battery pack. That is also important. So it's critical to get all of these uh, questions answered at the design stage. Now, how do people do that? Currently, like I said, because you have this huge parameter space, 
the only way you can do this is you buy some cells, you have to tear them down, you have to run some experiments on them, uh, and that takes a lot of time. So there's a bunch of different experiments you have to do, EIS, uh, calorimetry, and so on and so forth. So you extract those parameters, then you conduct the physics based modeling, and then you uh, do the predictions. Uh, this is a time consuming process. Relying purely on data and doing uh, machine learning is also impossible at the design stage because you don't have the data when you don't have the battery card. So how are you going to do the experiments? And therefore, there's this new paradigm to predictive analysis. No? And that is called a hybrid modeling. So the way this works is, it's a combination of uh, machine learning and physics based modeling. Now one of the biggest reasons why people don't use pure machine learning for physical systems is because physical systems are highly non-linear. So uh, you know you, you get something called overfitting. So because they are non-linear, your machine learning algorithm, if you don't have enough data, can hit the wrong minimum, not the global minimum, but the local minimum. And that gives you incorrect results for, for, for your prediction. So the way hybrid analysis overcomes that is, first you have a physics-based model, which is a simplified model, so it's fast, you don't uh, need to spend uh, days or uh, months working on it. That sets the initial solution space for, uh, uh, for your uh, model. And then, once you have this pre-trained data, you use minimal experimental data to get that. And now you can be rest assured that it's going to be accurate because you are running the experiment. So it's coming from your own cell. So this is the approach which, which helps you overcome the problem of not having parameters, yet gives you accurate results when it comes to predictive analysis of patterns. And at Uja, I am proud to say that we are the first in the world to commercially make this ap approach available to everybody. So we have come up with our interface where uh, we, we, you know, where all of this is in the background, and we have present, you know, and we give this as a solution to, to our users. And like I said, our goal is to simplify the whole modeling process, right? So in the background, we are solving the entire problem, the physics, the machine learning, electrochemistry, energy transport. Everything is being done in the background. But in the foreground, we have kept it extremely simple. Because to me, right, it's, it, I, I often ask myself this question. If Google has simplified navigating through the internet or navigating on the roads through their search and their maps, so easy that even a 10 year old child can use their uh, tools to, to search for something online or to navigate in the real world. Why do we need people with advanced degrees who have to undergo months of training to use this kind of software? Right? I mean, it's the, the this problem of search is no less complicated. So it's just a matter of applying ourselves and creating an easy to use interface. And that's our ultimate goal. To create this interface where you get results today. And this is a big challenge, like I said, in the kind of market uh, the two and three winner market is, you cannot afford to do months and months of uh, modeling to get results. You want results today so you can move on to the design process. You don't want to invest in uh, time and resources to do. And that's what uh, our goal is to enable you to do. So we've come up with a tool, like I said, uh, which does this very easily. Uh, I'm not going to show you the tool now, but we have a booth here, so if you, any of you are interested, We'd love to show you our tool, we'd love to discuss it with you. Uh, very quickly, you know, we've done a lot of validation because like I said, we are a young company and uh, we are eagerly looking to work with uh, a lot of people. So as of now, we've done our own validation, uh, both for the thermal management with experiments and uh, so this is with real life data, by the way, thermal management and with uh, capacity fade as well. So we've done capacity fade both for uh, first life as well as second life. You know, we can do so again, I can discuss it the more, more technical details later and we'd love to talk with all of you. But in a nutshell, uh, what I urge all of you to think about is designing optimal packs will help you a lot in the long run. A lot of times, you know, what we've observed is that uh, when people make, uh, design electric vehicles, they have the entire uh, vehicle body and they say, okay, let's see where you can fit the uh, battery pack. And that may not always be the best approach because like I said, the battery pack is the most critical part of your, uh, uh, the entire EV. So my request would be think about designing ground up from the pack instead of trying to see where you can fit the pack. Um, and of course, you know, keeping the temperature in check, uh, predicting the life is critical to making sure that you don't face problems two or three years down the line. Uh, 
so with that, yes, I'd like to conclude. Thanks a lot. It was great talking to all of you. And like I said, we'd love to engage more with you. Uh, these are the three of us, two of us are here, and we need uh, this project time is a third co-founder, uh, Prashant. We are all excited to work with all of you, so uh, we'd love to talk to you to move to that one. Thanks a lot. Um, on the topic of safety in an IoT, in an EV uh, battery pack. Uh, so I think um, what I'm going to cover more about is uh, the application of IoT as technology uh, in any uh, environment, specifically with EV in the context. So uh, before that, I will just talk briefly about what we do um, at Napino Digital Solutions. I would like to uh, challenge Mr. Dravid that uh, probably you are four month old, I am also a three month old company actually. We got registered in the month of April. Uh, but we are part of a large group uh, called Napino Group, which has been in existence for like uh, 25 plus years. Um, I'm called as Napino Digital Solutions. The idea is to work with customers end to end from ideation to value generation. Uh, Napino Group is, uh, is like one of the leading electronic manufacturer in India. We are recorded in Manasar. Uh, but we have around 9 facilities all across India, approximately 5,000 plus employees and uh, we have uh, a lot of strong focus on R&D. We have around 175 R&D engineers that work in different uh, hardware designing and capability building technology. Ranging from automotive, uh, which is primarily in the two-wheeler segment, we work with customers like Hero Motor Co. Uh, and, and the others in the Indian market. Uh, but apart from that, we also do design and manufacturing of uh, technology that we are trying to indigenize uh, in India, like BLDC motor for air condition uh, setups or uh, LED lighting solutions. And, and uh, two years back, we started uh, also into, into the IoT segment. So I think uh, what we kind of offer to the market very quickly is these three verticals. Um, first is a full stack ODM service. I think uh, you all uh, are hearing a lot about uh, manufacturing uh, nowadays in India and the focus by the government and by uh, even the private members to enhance the capability in manufacturing. And what we do is we also try to uh, basically bring best of the technology from the world uh, to support a full stack ODM service for our customer. Starting from designing a prototype all the way to mass manufacturing uh, and returns uh, and supply chain and support, repair, rework and etc. So it's kind of a complete hardware life cycle management uh, capability that we bring. There are some of the products that we are working on, uh, ranging from uh, transportation, logistics industry to industry 4.0 and so on. Uh, this is like a quick snapshot of one of our factories in Manisar. Uh, we have some of the world class lines there like in uh, uh, by uh, ASM and Yamaha and Panasonic, uh, which are the uh, high speed uh, SMT lines. So we manufacture around 25 million components uh, uh, subcomponents and assemblies in a year for our customers. So now coming to the topic of today, I think uh, uh, why IoT is so important as a technology in the segment of electric vehicle, right? And specifically focusing around the topic of safety. Uh, I'm sure I'm talking to the audience uh, where many of you are technical. So my presentation from here on is, is very technical in nature. Uh, uh, so excuse me for that. Uh, but I'm going to first define IoT in a very layman. Again, I'm just trying to repeat myself, most of you would have um, known IoT as a technology. But if you uh, think of IoT in a very, very layman, uh, what it does is basically, you have some kind of information like a heat coming from a mug right here, which your eyes capture like a sensor. It transports to your nervous system into your brain, right, which computes and tells you don't touch the mug, it is hot, right? It's basically making you smarter by giving you a guidance uh, with the help of the sensor that is your eye cap capturing that information, right? Similarly, IoT is doing the same thing, right? You have a sensor which basically can capture the heat uh, from any environment, right? Uh, it can transport that information or, or that data over the internet or in a local network like Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi or a point-to-point. -point. And then uh, there will be an uh, engine sitting somewhere in a cloud or maybe on a data center to process that, right? So what is IoT in a very, very basic term is it is the source of information or data coming to you from various environmental and contextual conditions, which was not possible many, many years ago. IT has been there for many uh, years, but what has become in the recent years is that the technology has become more viable. It has become more economical to be afford, and it has become uh, more smaller in size and higher in compute power. And that is why IT is becoming so relevant today. 
So with that way, let's talk about IoT for electric vehicle, right? Uh, and let's try to understand when we think of any EV today. And we have seen some incidents in the news uh, recently of uh, EVs catching fire and other things, right? And one of the core component of any EV is battery. Uh, and when you look at any BMS today, right, uh, which basically gives you information about the health of the battery pack uh, in terms of temperature, voltage, and etc. All that information is there sitting inside the vehicle. It is important that that information is carried to both the driver of the vehicle and the OEM of the vehicle and maybe other ecosystem provider, right? And that is where IT can come into play. I will talk shortly about that in the next slide. I think battery management system is one of the crucial area for application of IoT in EV. Uh, driver safety, I will also cover certain things around how using a camera based solution you can implement driver monitoring and driver safety protocols uh, in a two wheeler or a four wheeler EV. Third is theft detection. Uh, I think uh, from the scalability, EV has not reached that scale, at least in India. Uh, where we are worried about the bike uh, or the two-wheeler or even the four-wheeler getting stolen. But there are already solutions in the market which are using technology like IoT, right, to track the vehicle's whereabout uh, or the location or geofence uh, so that uh, you are alerted when something is going wrong or somebody is trying to steal it. Uh, fourth and very important area, I think, which is now uh, also being very widely heard from multiple four-wheeler OEM and two-wheeler OEM today is the capability to alert on in case of fall or uh, uh, basically crash, right? Now when we talk about uh, fall detection um, in, a, in a bicycle, I think right, one of the very important use cases, uh, there are many times uh, somebody who is riding a bicycle which doesn't have the balance uh, because it is on a two tire kind of mechanism or a two wheeler, uh, uh, during an accident, uh, what should be done uh, immediately after the accident? So it doesn't necessarily apply to EV only. But it applies to any two wheeler where this can be an applicable use case. Um, next is fault alerts. I think uh, uh, I was hearing uh, the session since morning, even before the lunch, we were talking about uh, the R&D capability and the capability in terms of implementing the right solutions inside an EV, right? Or whether it is thermal management or whether it is any type of other fault that can occur inside a vehicle. But if I, if you are not able to really get the information in the right uh, uh, time, like in real time, uh, you won't be able to take the right action, right? So it means it is not important that you report the fault. It is more important that you report the fault at the right point of time before it becomes actually a bigger issue, whether in the vehicle or whether for the driver of the vehicle, right? Both. And last is predictive maintenance. Uh, uh, I think predictive maintenance is, is a very common term these days. We all hear about uh, vehicles like Tesla or even any connected vehicle that has a connected capability inside it, whether it's MG Hector, uh, which says internet inside, right? They all say that my vehicle is getting tracked in real time when you're driving it, and it is actually able to give certain inputs back to you uh, as, a, as a driver and to the dealership uh, to understand whether it needs maintenance. Maybe it is getting overdriven in, in a period of three months uh, and it needs some kind of a maintenance or a repair to be done and you need to visit the facility, right? Earlier, I think we were basically relying on the agency calling us that by the six months or that's the kilometer or you want to come and get your vehicle repaired or uh, maintained, right? Uh, but I think predictive maintenance is enabling uh, a better mechanism to have, have that kind of uh, implementation. So, uh, what I'm covering is that uh, Apart from the safety norms, IoT uh, can actually be also be implemented in various other formats. Right? You can you can do firmware updates through connectivity into a vehicle. You can do charging data analysis. You can do charging. Like you can basically understand the mileage report, and, and maybe you can collect other parameters that are useful for you. Okay. So, like with that, let's let's understand the first concept of battery management system. Right. Um, the the picture you see here is one of the board. That is basically it is a simple PCB board that goes inside the battery pack. Okay, think of any battery pack. Like at Napino, we also have our own battery pack that we are working on. Um, but uh, I think a battery is a very complex chemistry and physics uh, combination. And uh, I think some of the sessions earlier have really covered it well. Uh, so we are we are trying to say that if you understand that even after spending two years of time in what just I think uh, Travit covered earlier that only you are spending two years in validating the thermal management, right? Um, but even after that, when the vehicle goes on the road, issues can occur. And that is when this BMS type of board can come in very handy, right? 
you, this board actually is able to connect with the battery pack and the battery chemistry and is able to capture certain critical parameters. The, the most important is temperature, right? We are hearing that since morning today. Thermal, heat, heat dissipation. And then there are other parameters like current flow, voltage, uh, and maybe a few other things that you can monitor. You can also monitor vibration. There could be certain battery which if they are subjected to a lot of vibration, they can result in some kind of a failure or inefficiency. So that, that's a battery pack. But mainly when you look at BMS, right? A BMS is either deployed locally inside a battery pack, right? And it can be monitored with uh, some kind of mechanism inside the vehicle, or you can implement IoT and enable a BMS to be monitored remotely, right? And that is where the difference comes into play. Uh, now, in, in addition to doing that, when you connect it to the monitoring circuit, you can enable not just temperature, voltage, and current, but it could be other critical parameter, right? During the motion, while it is getting charged in the charging spot, that is also possible where the battery might get overheated, right? Or even if it is just parked uh, somewhere around. So, like if we look at any BMS today, right? That's one of the example uh, of a simple BMS application. It's like a mobile app that is giving you certain data about uh, the battery health uh, with this kind of a board that is like a connectivity board. Okay. So when you want to transfer the data, you need some kind of connectivity, right? Typically, in an EV type of segment, you will use uh, cellular connectivity because EV is mostly on the road, out in the air. So you will typically use 2G or, or 4G today, and very soon you will uh, look at 5G. So most of the BMS connectivity solution is going to use these two type of boards out there. One is the BMS board, the core board that talks to the battery. And second is the connectivity board, the LD protocol or 4G or 5G protocol, like a tracker that is able to transfer the data to the cloud over the internet. And where there can be some application giving you data or statistics on a mobile app, either to the driver or in a dashboard app to the OEM or even the dealership. So that is one application of that uh, IOT in the EV side. Another application which I think uh, we are hearing about driver monitoring solutions a lot these days, right? Uh, they are also called as ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, right? Why they are called as ADAS? Because typically application of an ADAS is in a four-wheeler for uh, a vehicle which is either in semi-autonomous driving mode or fully autonomous driving mode, right? Uh, and if you look at other applications of driver monitoring systems, uh, they are in logistics and transportation industry where there are fleets of trucks where I want to monitor the health of the driver while they are driving the four wheeler or the two wheeler, uh, uh, the commercial truck or the passenger truck, right? Now, what I think is that when you think of a solution like this and if you can uh, sufficiently miniaturize it and integrate it inside a two wheeler vehicle and you can actually monitor the driver who is actually driving the two wheeler for different conditions. Whether the driver is feeling sleepy, the driver is actually not paying attention, the driver is not wearing the helmet, the driver is talking on a mobile phone while the uh, vehicle is being actually in the acceleration, or the driver is actually distracted uh, and not looking in the front. There are multiple use cases. If you look at, I don't know how many of you follow the accident rate in India, but in India we have uh, one accident every four minutes, uh, sorry, two minutes, one fatal accident every seventh, seventh minute. And the majority of the accidents which are in the light threatening situation are caused by two wheel segment. Most of the light threatening accidents where a person is only SLD certified by Tripura in the automobile industry. There are many SLD compliant by Tripura. However, this is the only one in automotive industry which is SLD certified. <coughs> Moving on to the next. So the purpose of the the use uh, the need of microcontroller here is. <coughs> so, microcontroller runs a software called F2C, speed oriented control. It takes an input like current sense from the current sensor that you can see also the inputs from the motor like motor, motor angle and it provides, it optimizes the software, provides an optimum torque to the motor. And then the next block that you see is three phase driver IC. Three phase driver IC takes the PWM pulses from the microcontroller and it also has some protections like over current protection, over voltage protection, short circuit protection, yes, sir. Sorry? Oh, okay. It's okay? Yeah, that's fine. <coughs> so, the three phase get driver IC takes the phenomenon pulses 
for the microcontroller, also intentional protection like overcurrent, over voltage, short circuit, circuit protection, and it actually switches the MOSFETs. So on the next point, you see there are MOSFETs. So basically, these MOSFETs can be parallel. Uh, so there are there are six MOSFETs being used. Two, two MOSFET for each phase since this is a three phase motor, and uh, uh, these MOSFETs can be parallel to to drive more current. And in pinion, if you know that we have got the broadest, and uh, I would say in the broadest portfolio in terms of MOSFET, whether it is low voltage to high voltage or lower current to high current, and different packages from D square pack to C or two four seven volt packages, old and old old D package. I will be discussing about those packages in the the next one is basically current sensor, very important component. It actually senses the current at each phase and it provides the feedback to the micro. So <coughs> in Infineon, our two is the center of competence in two names. You might have seen video a couple of times during the morning. So we built a very simplified solution uh, for our customers with a Google module. Uh, currently, customers are using very expensive modules from uh, a core based module from, uh, from our competitors. However, we came up with a coreless technology. We built these modules locally in India, we partnered with uh, one of the companies, and we are actually shipping the modules with, with, with our partner in India itself. And we also have got a patent for this. Uh, and the PMIC, or in the PMIC is in, in, the, in the block scheme, you can see PMIC. However, on the right hand side, in this uh, system solution, we have used PCP CMPOs. Uh, this is for the most simplification purpose. Pimic is also basically it has got multiple reasons as you already know. That's about the inverter. Another safety critical component is battery management system. Uh, again, the left side is the block scheme, right side is the system solution, by opinion, uh, by our application exports. Uh, in our two wheeler center of competence, Pune, it is a 48 volt, 70 volt centralized PMX port. <coughs> it is using all the components which are listed below, starting from our SLT microcontroller. Uh, basically, the purpose of microcontroller here is to communicate with the entire vehicle, also to manage the state of charge, state of health of the battery. <coughs> now, the next one is cell balancing IC or the cell balancing IC. Basically, this is uh, this monitors the voltage across each cell and it. it it calculates the state of charge, state of health, and provides all the input to the microcontroller to take a decision. And then these MOSFETs. These MOSFETs are basically battery disconnect switch MOSFETs. So these are required for charging and discharging. Or in case of any you know uh, unusual cases or, or thermal runaway, battery need to be disconnected. These need to be disconnected. These are being used. Yes, these, these are basically a switch, which like one and off switch. This will cut off the entire battery, uh, entire, entire vehicle from the battery. Next one is the differentiating technology and quality offered by NCT. So I am going to spend some time on this slide, a uh, very important slide. We have been hearing about quality since morning. I believe I have heard 100 times uh, about the quality since morning. So just wanted to emphasize, uh, since I mentioned that we are number one in North Pole semiconductor, number one power semiconductor manufacturer, number one in many areas. So what what is the reason behind? What what are the key? Uh, you know, I would say what is the foundation? What is the base for being that number one? What is that recipe? The recipe is very simple. Opinion is a quality leader. That means we, if you see this graph, right? We call it as path of curve, right? So. What we see is automotive quality is the need of uh, automotive vehicles, and what we see, what we have seen in the recent the recent past mainly with the two uh, with the start they are actually compromising there, and then we see a lot of incidents happening uh, you know, uh, these days on the road like fire incidents. Which happen. It's not mainly not because of these components, but could be for other reasons. But this is another one of the safety uh, very very important safety critical. So, if you look, if you look at Infineon has got a zero defect policy, and to achieve zero defect policy over the 15 years, 15 plus years of product life cycle, we need to go beyond AC2 standards. So, if you know AC2 standards, the acceptable defect rate 
in the ACQ uh, standards is basically one defect per million. And I also mentioned in my previous slides that the electronics content is going high and high. I'll just give you a classic example. In an electric two-wheeler, sorry, in a two-wheeler, when it used the electronic fuel injection or basically your combustion engine, the semiconductor content was hardly $20 per vehicle. However, if we talk today, in, in terms of electric vehicle, the semiconductor content in an electric vehicle is in the range of $100. That means five times it has increased. So that means, and I'll just give you a very simple example, the MOSFET, the count of the MOSFETs which were used in uh, EFI system and now in the electric vehicles has increased from two to, uh, two to four numbers to almost 40 numbers per vehicle. So that means, if we see that, if we still stick to AC, ACQ standard, ACQ standard talks about one effect per million, and with 40 MOSFETs per vehicle, translates to a defect in each vehicle at 20,000, 25,000 first vehicle will have a defect. Can we can, uh, can afford to have that kind of defect? The answer is no. So, Infineon understood with Infineon uh, understood. So, what what Infineon uh, believes is ACQ standard is must, but not sufficient to meet <coughs> the mission profile of the safety critical applications like inverter and battery management system and ACQ standard when it was formed, it was meant for typical applications like older generation applications but it failed to cover the newer applications like electric vehicle uh, applications like inverter or battery management system, these systems are almost as well. So what we did is with the application know-how, with the system expertise, with some design goals, with very stringent process in the manufacturing, we managed to reduce the uh, defect rate from one defect per million to 50 defects per billion, which is still much acceptable. We just get to about not two million per vehicle will have a defect, which is pretty much acceptable. And that's the reason, being an automotive, uh, being the quality leader, uh, we understand all these quality parameters of automotive very well. And we also test these devices not up to 1000 hours, which is typical of ACQ. We tested up to 3000 hours to avoid any delimitation uh, in because of this very stringent mission profile in this LCQ. So, moving on to the next slide, yes, uh, next differentiating technology that Infineon offers is silicon carbide. There are many, many benefits of silicon carbide compared to silicon. Um, silicon carbide is a wide band gap technology. And it, it comprises, it, it, as compared to silicon, it's, fi it's faster, smaller, and more efficient. It basically leads to high switching frequency, high power density, uh, lower losses, resulting in uh, high, high voltage battery savings. Quickly, I'm going to the next slide. So, yes, we still, uh, okay, basically, the cost between silicon and silicon carbide is basically silicon carbide is equal to Tx, roughly on an average, in terms of price. So it only makes sense, but if your, your, the overall system size goes down, it only makes sense if your battery capacity is more than 50 kilowatt hours, which is the tipping point which is mentioned. Moving on to the next differentiating technology, which is top double T or uh, top side cooling MOSFETs. Uh, you see that. Uh, so basically, this is a top side cooling MOSFET. This is a one step up technology uh, wherein we put in the heat sink on top of the MOSFETs. Customers, so, so MOSFET is sandwiched between heat sink and PC. Customers don't have to actually really worry about the, whether they have to use metal black pieces, they can go with their car. It's just a little cheaper and they can put the heat sink on top of it and the thermal dissipation can easily be managed uh, with, with the top sink cooling mechanism. The next differentiating, and it has got 20% uh, better RTH, lower RTH on The next uh, differentiating technology is chip embedded technology. Basically, this is one of the most innovative uh, technology in the in, in the portfolio MOSFET space, or even in the MOSFET MOSFET technologies. We embed the chip inside the PCB. There is no lead resistance. Uh, and, 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 and even this, this results in much lower RTS as well as 0.6 billions. So this is one of the in most inputs as still we are trying to balance out on the cost and technology. We have we, we proved the concept, we already have some partner, Spoiler, and 
you know, few packages which they have done for us, which is some kind of uh, some tiles. And however, we are still optimizing on the cost, so this is still not going to go, but this is one of the most innovative uh, that we have done. So with this, I will now first give this to R37 plus R minus. A lot of us must remember our first mobile phones, the Nokia 1100 or the Samsung C300s, the difficulty, the torture of sending a text message to our loved ones from those phones, and also the charm of playing a snake game. And then our hands were presented with, with a Walkman phone from I think Sony Ericsson. And then, and then uh, I think a QWERTY phone from, from Nokia and Samsung's and then a Blackberry uh, and in a couple of years the first iPhone came and then the Androids came and today all of us for so many years have been sporting smartphones. When did all of this happen? It happened right under our noses. And that's exactly what is happening to EVs, my friends. Time of the electric vehicle is here. For due to any naysayer, to anybody who doubts and says, "Will EV ever happen?" Please quote them this short story. It's already happening. So the past four years, I've been noticing number of electric scooters which zip past me when I'm driving on the roads. It used to be one every one week, and then it used to be one every three days, and today it's one every five minutes. I speak of Bangalore, I speak of Gurgaon. And if that is happening, it leads us to the most pressing problem, which is blocking possibly the mass scale adoption of electric vehicles in, in India which is what I am going to speak about today. I am going to share my experience and my learnings for the past four years being in this industry. For the first three years I was building uh, alongside colleagues this organization called Sun Committee which was in Matthias Committee for the past year and uh, so I have been building electric paint. So yes, of course all of us, that's how EVs are going to grow in terms of adoption. Uh, you have government schemes and ideal running conditions, all of that is only in our favor, like I mentioned. The biggest hurdle I see is range anxiety, loosely translated, where will I charge? And you know, how will I pay for it? And what will I do if I get suddenly stranded on the road somewhere? Now, the, the, the fueling behavior that we all of us have grown up, has been through petrol cars or scooters of course. When you walk into a petrol pump, you spend two minutes and then you walk out. EVs take time, even with the so-called fastest of the fast chargers, it still takes at least an hour plus. And therefore the global EV refueling behavior shaped as EVs usually get charged while they are parked. You are at home for eight to nine hours, you are at office for eight to nine hours. A scooter takes about four to five hours to full charge using your standard five hour adapter, good enough. If charging facilities are therefore not available in every parking location, this is what will happen. That's legit. It's Googleable. It, it was a very famous thread on Twitter. Everyone spoke about it. Harvish tweeted, Vijay Shri BSS retweeted. That's legit. The poor guy had to take this to the fifth floor, take it into the kitchen, and then charge. This is where scooters get parked in India. The India where scooters get parked is beyond the India which a lot of us live in. It's an India where a lot of us have grown up. If I have to, uh, if I'm allowed to use vernacular scooter, Baramdi may park over here in a common parking lot. Not every scooter has a dedicated parking lot in India. That's where charging needs to happen. Now, if you, what, what do we need to charge an electric scooter? Of course, electricity. But it's, 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 it's very difficult to pull a cable from your room's meter, your flat is located somewhere, your meter is stuck away somewhere else. It's very difficult. What's available on the 
is the common electricity line of the building, of the society, of the office, of the mall, etc., etc. And the charger comes along with a scooter in the boat. Yes? The real problem is a metering problem. That if you are using the common electricity line of the society, how does the society come to know who's used it? How much has someone consumed? And then the problem of collections, collecting maintenance from residents is, is a big uh, torture for society associations. And therefore, what got invented was something called an LAC, a low cost AC charger. It's not a charger, first of all, it's called a low cost AC charger, it's a socket. It's just a smart socket which has a metering solution inside it, solves all of these problems. This got invented. This is where we are right now. Hmm? And therefore, the hypothesis was, my hypothesis was that every parking lot will start seeing these various kinds of low cost smart sockets coming up. Which happened? My colleagues in this industry, Bold, Kazam, Kazam is now doing a lot of other things, Charles, EVRE, EVM, and the slide is you know, too small to incorporate. There are so many players who are providing these hardware. Some of these hardware work with their own apps. Now comes the real problem. It's blasphemous, in my opinion, to expect a user to have 20 different apps on the phone to keep frantically looking, will I get a charging facility in this app or will I get this? It does not reduce range anxiety, it increases range anxiety. What a consumer needs is one solution. And the second problem is on the right side of the screen. They are fundamentally a low trust society. It's a bold statement to make, but I'm sure some of us at least agree on this. In the past 50 years, when we go to petrol, on every petrol pump, the boy and the girl who is defueling says, Sir, Madam, zero check early check please. And Sir or Madam, zero check that day. We don't even, we not just check for zero, we also keep staring at the machine whether he or she is actually putting that amount of fuel that I have asked for or not. Combining all of these hypotheses that multiple different hardwares working with their own apps have come up and it's real estate on the phone is very difficult. And the problem of low trust. My hypothesis is that a consumer would require one single source to find, use and pay. And the source would be most trusted, which should be sort of like an aggregation platform or a hybrid kind of a platform, but one source. That's my hypothesis. It will, the charging solutions for electric two wheelers therefore will get elicited in the following manner. A, all of these low cost smart sockets, all of them working with a single app and the app ensures that the user is paying exactly what he or she is consuming for. Just to put it out there, there are three kinds of chargers, right? regular charging, fast charging and then battery swapping. My perspective for two wheelers, three wheelers, four wheelers is a regular 3.3 kilowatt hour charging mechanism is a must have. That's how two wheelers for personal mobility will primarily charge. That's what I have observed uh, over one year of building uh, electric pay. Fast charging is a good to have and battery swapping is also good to have. However, in case of commercial mobility, let's say of three wheelers, battery swapping suddenly takes a lot of uh, preeminence. But we are talking about electric two wheelers here. That's my perspective. This is how we can stack up the types of EV charging infrastructure. We always speak about public and private. There is also one more use case, which is a semi-public use case, which is an apartment use case. Where the apartment says, listen, I allow my residents to charge, but I will not allow someone outside to come and come into the society and charge. That's the third use case. Hmm? Now, your public use case ideally works for commercial mobility really well, a delivery boy of Swiggy or a, or a big basket will use a commercial uh, mobility, you know, use case or public use case, my apologies, to top up or swap. The private and 
little semi public, which is an apartment use case, for example, will will be ideal for the personal mobility use cases. Now, I think uh, all indicators clearly state that India will be the EV capital of the world. If we realize the, the enthusiasm around EVs. My calculations say that there will be at least 160 million electric two and four wheelers running around on the Indian roads by 2030. There are already close to 500 startups in this EV space. Now, when all of this happens, what, how will the future version of charging look like? I think the future version of charging will be interoperability. What's interoperability? That an EV driver is able to use charging or swapping stations regardless of the charging point operator, regardless of the charge point network. It's imminent. Otherwise, if charge point operators and charge point networks start creating closed networks, for example, and limit only certain kinds of users or OEMs to use, it will create sort of a CNG kind of situation. It's like buying a vehicle which only works with a certain kind of fuel, which uh, is made by only one particular kind of uh, manufacturer, it becomes worse than a CNG kind of situation. I think this is imminent. Why? It's because it reduces range anxiety for users. You are able to charge or swap anywhere. It increases the utilization of CPUs because then users start coming in across networks. And eventually it leads to 100% adoption of EVs. Today, charge point networks are working in closed loops. Eventually, the way I hypothesize that will, everybody will have to open up. And who can accelerate this interoperability to kick in? I think is our aggregation platforms because aggregation platforms by first principles are or should be unbiased in nature and therefore aggregation platforms I think can lead uh, Indian charging infrastructure into interoperability. That's all. Thank you so much. I wish all of you an electric future and a very happy weekend ahead.